Th these indeed have been uh, very unusual times in the market. Uh, I have um, uh, personally watched many of these cycles, but nothing like this one uh, previously. Um, little factoid that ran on the Bloomberg yesterday, that 777, uh, excuse, 777 point drop in the Dow on Monday equaled the full uh, amount or full size of the Dow in 1982 when it was approximately 777 points in the second year of the Reagan administration. Uh, some people might argue that uh, Reagan's deregulation might have been what caused this great uh, period of growth and ultimately the bubble. Uh, and now we're going uh, back, but hopefully we, we won't go back to 777. It'll just keep falling at that amount. Um, uh, I think um, you've agreed that uh, Professor Lemer, you'd like to start, or uh, Professor Longstaff, excuse me. Got it. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Let me uh, move over here. I have just kind of a, a short uh, PowerPoint presentation put together uh, to just kind of give a quick timeline of where I think uh, we are, how we got to where we are, and uh, maybe where we're headed here. Let's start off a little bit uh, describing, I think, how we got to where we are. I think the roots of this can probably be traced back to September 11th. 2001. Uh, we all remember those events. In the aftermath, the financial uh, panic in the, the markets led to a kind of expansionary loose monetary policy in order to kind of get the economy moving again. We saw the Fed lowering rates and basically interest rates eventually declined to 1%. Very, very low rates historically and that was needed. It was viewed to stimulate the economy. And stimulate the economy, it did. And very quickly, uh, we had uh, kind of a boom in the housing market, which is great if you own tech stocks and we're smarting over the losses there. Very quickly, real estate seemed to come back and that kind of pulled uh, our portfolios up again. And so there was a big boom in housing, demand for mortgages. In the meantime, some of the government agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, decided this is a great thing, let's jump in there, let's get involved, and they expanded their mortgage lending dramatically. They were kind of the lowest cost producers in the market and had a bit of a competitive advantage in the funding side. So not surprisingly, they sort of stepped up, and uh, kind of a side effect, however, is that they ended up crowding a lot of the other financial institutions out of the market who weren't quite as funding competitive. A uh, side effect of that, an unintended side effect, is that these other institutions had to do something. And so they said, well, we can't sort of compete with the uh, prime conventional mortgages. Let's kind of look uh, for other market niches. And so very quickly, they were kind of into uh, all sorts of alternative types of lending, all day, option arms, uh, subprime, et cetera. And we all kind of know where that went. So these other institutions started uh, realizing they could do this. They packaged the loans, sell them off to investors. Some of the riskier pieces were put with hedge funds, with uh, you know, pension funds, etc. cetera. Well, they retained a lot of the, what they viewed were the safer pieces of those uh, mortgage uh, securitizations. So they thought they were sitting on very, very high quality paper that was uh, paying attractive uh, spreads. Well, we kind of know the story. In the last couple of years, very quickly, these losses on these uh, subprime mortgages started to materialize, expand, and even the safer pieces of these mortgage securitizations started taking big losses. And uh, well, then people started getting in trouble, and obviously the people that get hit first when you have assets dropping in value are the people that are most leveraged. So no surprise, the first wave of this crisis revealed itself as the most leveraged players in the market, typically Wall Street, the investment banks, you know, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Fannie and Freddie were kind of the first to go. So that basically then led to the next wave, okay? The problems with these financials, uh, however, start making markets nervous about all financials, not just the Wall Street types that are very leveraged, maybe the ones that are in better capitalized, Everybody starts getting a little bit more nervous about who might be in the headlines tomorrow. And so the cost of borrowing start going up for all financial institutions, and for that matter, for everyone else. And so in recent months, we've seen some of the prime funding uh, rates like LIBOR start spiking, moving up a couple hundred basis points. 
So like from 1% to 2% to 3%. May not sound like a lot, but these folks are, you know, kind of funding themselves at low rates and trying to invest at, uh, you know, make 100 basis points is a good, uh, good day for a bank. These uh, higher costs, however, started showing up in other markets. There's a market for what we call credit insurance. If we had more time, I have a little slide on what credit default swaps are. In a nutshell, they're simple insurance contracts where a company, an insurer, basically sells protection against a company going into default. It's kind of like fire insurance, except for your bond rather than your car. And, uh, but the cost of insurance started going up, and some of these folks that had sold uh, credit protection, they started seeing their potential liabilities going up. Same thing happens to Allstate when they're looking at their portfolio and suddenly a couple of hurricanes start showing up in the Gulf Coast, and they suddenly realize, wow, we may not be as well capitalized as we'd like to be. Because of that, the folks that were doing credit insurance, you've heard names like Monolines, we've seen uh, like a uh, big largest insurance company, AIG, get into trouble, start losing money because they were, in essence, insuring against credit risk and suddenly credit risk starts uh, arising. So that led to the second wave of sort of credit problems in the market. We've seen that very, very recently. And so in some sense, this has been spreading uh, to other sectors. So to summarize, where are we now? Well, we're a bit of a nervous situation right now. I've actually been camping out uh, kind of uh, on the trading floor of a major West Coast uh, fixed income uh, shop and uh, kind of sort of watching the traders and uh, you know they're all dragging themselves in at 3 a.m. in the morning, going home at 10 o'clock at night. I think there's a crisis, the length of the crisis can only last as long as people can stay on their feet. So <laughs> what's going on though is that uh, we've seen as people become more nervous about risk, credit risk, they start wanting to, to have more and more insurance. And so the cost of borrowing, if you, have, if you have risky debt, is skyrocketed. What that means then, banks won't be making as much unless they can pass along the higher costs. Recently, their cost of funding at the short end have gone up several hundred basis points. Implication of that is that the availability of credit has declined. Uh, a lot of these financial institutions were relying on one-day credit. So every day, they had to refinance their mortgage, so to speak. And all it takes is for one day in the repo markets for there not to be able to run over, roll over their financing, and they're in trouble. But now what's happening is the term structure is much flatter. The short end has come up, the long end is where, about where it used to be. It's much flatter and so it's going to be much easier for these institutions to kind of push out their funding maturities and that probably is going to add some stability to the market. But we see a lot of financials scrambling to strengthen their balance sheets uh, directly hopefully via equity issuances, investors, you know, Warren Buffett. However, sometimes you have to do that indirectly via a merger. And so I think where we're going here, the implications for, for us all is that credit is likely to be a little bit more or more expensive going forward. That turns student loans, mortgages, car loans, we're just simply the cost of insurance has gone up. And the issue, of course, uh, Professor Lima will be talking about, I'm sure he'll be about how much will then this slow down the economy? You know, if we have a bit of a credit crunch here, Credit availability drops 10, 15 percent. How much is that going to impact growth? How much does that impact the real economy? There's some that argue that maybe the growth that we saw was a little bit artificial because folks that were going in, uh, maxing out their credit cards or buying these homes with subprime mortgages may not have been spending their own money. They were spending your money. And uh, that may be, so it may have been an illusionary growth. Maybe we'll be looking at more sustainable growth. But the real concern right now, and I think this is the uh, genesis for the uh, Congress stepping in uh, right now, is concerns about bank runs. You know, if everybody goes and says, we're worried about WAMU going belly up, if everybody runs down, pulls out their money, then even if they're well capitalized, you know, you saw it all in that, you know, Jimmy Stewart movie about it's a wonderful life, right? What happens is that you can't all get out at the same time. There's a bit of a congestion in the market. People are forcing the dump things that are illiquid at low prices. And so, you know, WAMU probably didn't have to happen. There was just a bit of a panic. Uh, a lot of deposits walked out the door. And so it's that, you know, we only have fear itself to fear sort of a mentality. Uh, there's been recent concerns about money market funds. You put in $100 and you always thought you'd be able to take out $100. And suddenly one of them said, oops, 
you can only take out 97 cents on the dollar. This is the problem of call, we call breaking the buck. Now, Congress has sort of stepped in there to sort of uh, try to ensure that that won't happen to money market funds. But, you know, little things like that uh, might be popping up in different markets. We've seen that certainly in the municipal bond market, repo markets. So the real concern then, I think, is that people will just panic, pull their money out of financial institutions, which I personally think would be a very, very bad mood. Move. We're seeing a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of money on the sidelines. A lot of people looking at these prices and saying things are getting awfully cheap. There's a lot of money on the sidelines, is my view, ready to step up as soon as uh, we think we have hit the bottom. But anyway, it's this sort of uh, third wave that we are trying to address, I think Congress is trying to address with the bailout package. So let me kind of uh, conclude with that and turn it over to the moderator. I'm Ed Lehmer, and uh, so I pose a, a question to begin this. If you're going trick-or-treating this year, what's the scariest outfit that you can wear? <laughs> the answer is you want to dress up like Secretary Paulson, because he said trick-or-treat, and we're going to give him a $700 billion treat in order for him not to do the trick on us, which is the worst downturn, or even as bad as the Great Depression. So I say, <clears throat> take a deep breath, relax. We're not going to have a Great Depression. Whether the Congress passes this bill or not, we're going to get through this. We might have a more severe downturn because of the credit crunch, but trust me, it's not ever going to approach the levels of the Great Depression. Remember that the unemployment rate, which is elevated quite a bit already, up to 6%, is nothing like the Great Depression rate of 25%. And institutionally and the basic structure of the economy, you do not need to have all that fear-mongering coming out of our leaders in uh, in Congress and uh, in the executive branch and, and Bernanke too, because it's really that fear that drove down the, the equities virus, not something fundamental about the economy. So let me tell you, let me focus on the fundamentals. I'm, by the way, revealing my attitude, which I think this bailout plan was ill-conceived, ill-designed, and is definitely not the way to go, but I'll come back to that issue after, I, after we hear from Dick. I just want to talk about the real economy. So this gets started in a downturn in 2001. Housing, if you're forecasting, housing is a heck of a good indicator, leading indicator that you're going to have a recession. We've had 10 downturns since World War II, and problems in housing gave us a very clear signal ahead of eight of them. Two, it didn't. One was the, uh, what I like to call the Department of Defense downturn, which was the 1953 event uh, when the DOD cut back spending when the armistice, the Korean armistice was signed. They just dropped spending enormously. It was up to 14% of GDP. It drops back, back to 8% of GDP. There's no way the economy can make a transition from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy at the speed that the Department of Defense de demanded, and we had a, a difficult economic time. The other structural adjustment, which is material for today, was the 2001 downturn, which was a business downturn. Businesses invested very heavily in equipment and software, IT particularly, during that internet rush, and when profitability disappointed, Wall Street at some point insisted you had to have some E in those elevated P-E ratios, and the only way they could figure out how to get the E in there was to fire a bunch of people and cut back on their IT budgets. That was a structural adjustment, just like a transition from wartime to a peacetime economy. The old economy didn't come back. We haven't had a resurgence of the ratio of business investment relative to GDP. It's been back to the kind of more normal level. You had a kind of bubble in that expenditure in the real economy. That's a structural adjustment. Now, the thing that was abnormal about 2001 is that there was no participation in a downturn from either houses or cars or consumer durables. They plowed through that like it wasn't there. So best to understand that the Federal Reserve, through its interest rate policies, can affect the timing of the acquisition and building of houses and the timing of acquisition and building of cars, but it doesn't have much impact on a total. So normally, in the aftermath of the recession, you, you move sales of homes and cars forward in time because you didn't get the sales, you didn't get production during that weak recession, and you're going back and capturing the pent-up demand, the pent-up sales that didn't occur. But this time, the, the housing sector was strong, and uh, it was normal and getting stronger in 2001. The same thing with auto sales. I mean, after 9-11, everybody said, you never make a sale again. And the month after 9-11, you had an all-time record in terms of rates of automobile sales. So th that, that didn't participate. There were no missing sales, no lost sales during that period of time. So when the Fed 
gave us incredibly low interest rates because they thought the economy needed stimulating. They never thought about the uh, channel by which they would have an impact. And the channel is through these two critical consumer components. They don't have much impact on business investment except to the extent that they create opportunities on the, on the consumer side. Their direct impact is through the consumer spending on these two items, which are homes and cars. So then they, then they can't affect the total, they can affect the timing. There was nothing to take from the past because there wasn't any downturn with regard to those sectors in 2001, 2002. So where did the sales come from in 2003 and 2004? They didn't come from the past, they came from the future. So inevitably they traded relative strength of the economy in 2003 and 2004 for weakness coming out right now. You knew that there was going to be a problem going forward in both of these two critical sectors. Um, and, and we knew that the housing was an extremely accurate uh, predictor of recession. We knew that it was peaking out in 2005, and we started to think about what the recession scenario would be like. We thought it was inevitable that you'd have a real recession. But the, uh, then you start to see where is this recession going to hit home and, and which employment categories are going to decline the most. The critical sectors turn out to be manufacturing and construction. Outside of that, you don't get much job loss. The job market is the amplifier because people, if they've got their credit card, they still can spend even though the price of gas is going up. But you lose a job, that's when you definitely go default delinquencies on homes, you cut back spending. It's a big amplifier of the economy. The labor market is absolutely critical. So you start, have to worry about these two sectors, which are manufacturing and construction, where all the job loss traditionally occurs. Well, construction, we knew it was going to be laying off workers, maybe half a million, and that's about what's happened. But the thing about manufacturing, in each one of these cycles, it creates a V, where you, you trim and fatten. You lose a couple million jobs, and you gain them back. Trim and fat, and over and over, every one of these downturns. The 2001 was totally different in the sense that we trimmed three million jobs and they didn't come back. In fact, since then, the manufacturing jobs have been slowly, sl steadily disappearing. And we took a look at that and said, without the contribution, we, we just don't see without the fattening up that you're going to have the job loss in manufacturing. And without the amplifying effect of that job loss in manufacturing, you're not going to have a real recession. You can have a stumbling forward, sluggish growth, a weak job market, but not the kind of numbers that a real recession would entail. Then along came the credit crunch, which actually started uh, uh, August of last year when the subprime market had its total meltdown. At that time, uh, the Wall Street economists and analysts said, we're going to have the credit contraction of all times because you reduce the capitalization through losses on mortgage-backed securities with 30 to 1 leverage ratios, there has to be a big contraction in credit. Well, that's, so that's worrisome because the economy ultimately depends on credit to consumers to buy the, all the stuff that you buy at Walmart, also credit to businesses to expand real opportunities. So the real economy is what matters to me. It's not the trading of used paper on Wall Street. It's making sure that consumers and credit get, uh, consumers and businesses get credit to, to uh, buy real stuff. That's the real economy. And these guys said there was going to be the mother of all credit contractions. And I said, well, how exactly is this going to work? And I never got a very clear answer to that. And until I got a clear answer, I, I viewed that we're going to have a stumbling forward economy, but not even the, uh, the traditional recession levels. They said that the crash was going to occur at the end of last year. When it didn't occur at the end of last year, they said it's going to occur at the beginning of this year. And they totally resurrected that, but amplified it into now it's going to be the Great Depression. But if you look at the flow of funds accounts to try to find this credit contraction, which I think is a problem, I don't try to dismiss that as not a problem, but if through the second quarter of this year, the credit contraction has not shown up in the flow of funds accounts. By that I mean credit cons to consumers has been expanding, business liabilities have been expanding, there's not been a big credit contraction, and what you see instead is the kind of widening of risk spreads that is very characteristic of a weak economy going forward because businesses, if you're in the lending business, you have to worry about weaker revenue flows and problems with consumer loans in a, in a weak economy. And as a consequence, you're going to have a normal expansion of uh, a, a normal increase in credit spreads. But at, at that means that we're going to have to pay more for credit. Certainly in a mortgage market, there's been a big problem with not just uh, higher costs for loans, but also dramatically different lending standards than we had uh, two or three years ago. But outside of that sector, you can't see any kind of evidence of, of this severe credit contraction. But I tell you, we can talk ourselves into this problem. 
It's the labor markets as absolutely critical. And we have leaders who are doing all this fear mongering about a Great Depression, and they're putting together a, a package which frankly doesn't really address the fundamental questions as far as I'm concerned, doesn't really address the root questions, at least not in any obvious way, which means that there's going to be more problem. The fundamental problems in housing and home prices are going to continue to, to decline. There's going to be more defaults and more delinquencies, and the problems with mortgage-backed securities are not going to go away. You, nobody knows what prices should apply to these assets because nobody knows how severe the next wave of resets is going to be in terms of creating more defaults and delinquencies. It's not behind us. We're going to have a continuing problem in, in housing. And um, I don't think that this um, the bailout uh, addresses the fundamental issue. I don't think it's going to make a material impact on the course of the real economy. But if we scare everybody to death and we get businesses to think that a Great Depression is around the corner, they're going to respond. They're going to make a forecast the way they do, which is cut back employment. So I say just be calm, go out and buy a new pair of shoes or a purse, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll keep the economy going. Well, the good news is most of you are still in school for a year, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, Professor Roll, please. The, the Anderson School has this incredible history of when we invite a speaker from the business community to come here to campus to give a speech, uh, they often lose their job or are indicted shortly thereafter. <laughs> the, uh, we, uh, we, the Center for Finance had a, a little one-day conference last quarter, spring quarter, and the speakers at that conference were Richard Siren, who was then the chairman of Freddie Mac, and Mark Perry, who was then the chairman of IndyMac. Um, neither of those gentlemen have their jobs at the current uh, moment, as you well know. I remember Dick Siren said, uh, well, Freddie Mac is no problem unless the housing prices go down by at least 25%. And if you read the paper this morning, that's exactly how much they've gone down. Uh, and Freddie Mac, of course, is now owned by the government. But I, I do want to uh, say something about these different financial institutions that have either failed or been absorbed by others. Every story is a little bit different, and I'm going to get back to that in a moment. And what that implies is the cure for the problem is also going to have to be different depending on what kind of financial institution is currently in trouble that, that, uh, and that we need to help out of that trouble. If you look at Freddie and Fannie, I think a good case can be made in, for, for the government being responsible for their demise. But if you look at Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, it's certainly not the case. So they uh, were highly levered and, and made a lot of unwise decisions. And, and when financial institutions that are highly levered make a lot of bad investments, they often have problems. But, um, the, in, but I think we, what, when we look at what's going to happen in the future, uh, we need to keep in mind that the cure for these problems may not be the same for everybody. I want to I agree with Ed in one thing, is that right now we are not uh, anywhere close, at least yet, to being in the Great Depression. Uh, when I say yet, uh, you know, I always want to hedge our bets about that. For, for instance, about 4% of the mortgages that are outstanding in the country right now are delinquent. In 1934, that number was 40%. So you can see that the, diff, the, the mortgage market, just look at that alone, that's nowhere, we're not even close to there, and probably won't be. The unemployment rate today in the United States is in the neighborhood of 6%. Uh, back in those days, it was in 34, it was 25%. So you can see that um, at least up to this point, we are not there. There are about $11 trillion worth of mortgages outstanding in the United States, and about $500 billion worth of those are currently delinquent. But being delinquent doesn't mean they're worth nothing. Those uh, mortgages uh, are definitely not worth zero because some of them will start paying again, and some of the property that's the collateral for those mortgages can be, uh, can be foreclosed upon, and, and, and there would be some realization of that um, uh, from, from those sales so that when you look at a $700 billion bailout package and the entire problem is $500 billion worth of delinquent mortgages up to this point, assuming that, of course, we don't have any further problems, which is a big if, uh, you know, I don't think we need 
uh, any, anywhere near that kind of a bailout package, and I certainly agree with Ed on that uh, point. And furthermore, I don't think the form of the bailout package is even close to what really is necessary in order to help uh, solve our problems in the credit markets and get us out of this. Um, this morning, I, uh, as you know, the Senate is, is, is reconsidering or considering a, an alternative bill, uh, which is uh, kind of a, a revision of the one that the House turned down last uh, a couple of days ago. And if you, if you want to have some interesting fun and in reading, you can download the entire text of this bill from the Wall Street Journal website or other places on, on the web. I did that this morning and I took a look at the, the bill. Of course, I, I wasn't able to fully digest it because the bill is 451 pages long. <laughs> now, this raises the, always the problem is when the government gets involved in anything, it becomes extremely complicated. Uh, and for instance, there are writers on this current bill, the one the Senate is actually voting on this evening, that have to do with Hurricane Ike you know, all kind of stuff that has nothing to do whatsoever with the financial crisis. And if you want to look in, in, at some of the provisions, such as one I was interested in having to do with mark-to-market -market accounting, you really have to have a search engine to look through the bill till you find the, the point where you can look at this provision. There is a provision in there about mark-to-market -market accounting, which is one of the cures that a lot of people have talked about uh, doing away with to help financial institutions that uh, have whole loans on their books. Whole loans are non-securitized mortgages and about five or six trillion dollars worth of the total mortgage outstanding are not securitized and are held at historical costs in the books of a lot of financial institutions that would be insolvent if those mortgages were marked to market at current prices. So one thing the government, the SEC, along with the Financial Accounting Standard Boards is thinking about doing is to make it no longer necessary that when a, a company sells part of its underwater mortgage portfolio, it would have to mark to market all the rest of its mortgages that it holds on the books at historical cost. Now, whether or not that's a good idea, uh, most of us who are, uh, you know, trained in free market economics and transparency and things like that, are absolutely horrified by the thought uh, that you could give discretion to um, different financial uh, institutions and whether or not they market to market. And yet, believe it or not, here's what, was ha here's what actually happened yesterday in terms of this mark-to-market accounting. The SEC said that um, they will allow executives to use their own models in judgment if no market exists, or if assets are being sold only at fire sale prices, so they don't have to mark the market. So they've already promulgated a regulation like that. Now, you know, in my mind, one of the biggest dangers in this current situation is not the credit problems that we see that are obvious to, to everybody, but the reaction that might happen in response to this. We're gonna get a big bureaucracy if the bill passes tonight to, to deal with this. We're gonna get uh, changes in accounting rules. We're going to get all sorts of things that might have a lot more harmful effects in the long run than doing nothing at all. Because doing nothing at all is certainly one alternative and probably an alternative that might not uh, be so bad. But let me mention four different things that, uh, that are, are possible cures. One thing that's a possible cure is that the federal government could just buy all the delinquent whole loans from all the financial institutions in America and try to sell them later at some prices. Now, and that's, a, that's actually one of the proposals that's part of the Senate bill. The problem with that is, if they don't change the mark-to-market -market rule, no matter how much capital they have available to buy all those underlying mortgages, the institutions won't sell them and the reason they won't sell them is because then they'll have to mark to market the remaining portfolio, all their other mortgages, which are not, not worth 100% of the value. And so many financial institutions would be insolvent if they did this. Another proposal would be to have some kind of a recapitalization so that you would have uh, bondholders of medium and large size banks exchange some of their debt for equity, and that would cause, a, that would change the leverage ratio of those institutions. Now that, that I think will work, 
But it would work in the private sector too. The government doesn't have to be involved with that. Why hasn't that already happened? Very simple reason. The bondholders and the stockholders of those institutions for which that's feasible are waiting to see if there's a bailout package passed. Because why should the bondholders take a hit and exchange their bonds for stock if they can get the government to pay for the, the difference already? So I think that you know, the, the very fact that the government's considering something like a bailout already affects private actions that might have otherwise taken place. So, you know, that's a possibility though going forward is that kind of recapitalization can, can occur for certain institutions. And again, these institutions are heterogeneous. Certain institutions that would work. It won't work for the smaller and medium sized banks for very s simple reason. The liabilities of those kinds of institutions are mainly deposits. And depositors, like checking accounts and CD deposits and so on, have no, will not agree to get, to exchange their checking account deposits for shares of stock in the bank. Can you imagine that kind of a proposal? So you've got, you know, the vast bulk of, of banks which are holding these whole loans in their accounts are in that kind of a situation. So recapitalization will not help them. What will help them though is an increase in the FDIC guarantee, and that's one of the proposals which I approve of, raising that from 100 million to 250 million <laughs> will motivate people who've withdrawn funds from these banks to redeposit them. It'll also help money market mutual funds and things like that, uh, which gives me finally to the final point I wanna bring up, and that's the commercial paper market. As you probably know, the commercial paper market, which is the short-term market that finances most of the industrial businesses and other businesses in large business in the country, that has is, that is collapsed, basically. And there's a, there's a much da bigger danger there that, that non-financial corporations will find it very difficult to finance their short-term uh, borrowings because people have withdrawn money from the commercial paper market and are not willing to lend it even on a very short-term basis unless they have tremendously high interest rates. The term structure that Francis mentioned being flat is a prediction in the market that short-term interest rates are gonna decline over time, probably, if nothing else happens, but it's gonna take some time. So, um, first of all, I, I, don't think the, I don't think things are that bad. I think there are certain proposals that are, you know, that are worth considering. Most of this Senate bill, though, is complete garbage in my opinion and, and I hope the house has the backbone that it had the other day and turns it down. Professor Roll, thank you very much. Um, I, we need to move along to get to the Q&A session or um, uh, a few moments so I can interrogate you as well. Uh, one quick question for each of you. Uh, Professor Longstaff, you said money is on the sidelines ready to step up as soon as they think we've hit the bottom. So somebody out there is actually uh, doing okay? Who, who, are the, who is this money on the sidelines besides Warren Buffett? There's a lot of money there that is in, an un, in unleveraged entities. Uh, you know, there's funds, pension accounts, sovereign wealth funds. There's a lot of folks that are investors that are not leveraged. So for them, when the, uh, the market goes down 10%, that's a 10% loss. If you're leveraged 30 to one, then you're, you're out of business. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of that money here. And, uh, one of the things that we've seen with uh, the mortgage market is that it's actually, it sort of looks, uh, well, maybe I can just kind of show you quickly. Uh, this is kind of what has happened to these mortgage derivatives uh, over time. And you can kind of see the whole thing here. This is the beginning of the mortgage crisis last year, actually started in January. And what happened is that we had a big shock and suddenly the value of these investment grade mortgages, uh, CDOs all dropped to about 80, 70 percent, at which point a bunch of people jumped in, started distressed mortgage funds, jumped in there, uh, a lot of folks did that. After a couple more months, it dropped another 20 points, and so those folks lost a lot of money. At that point, a bunch of other people start mortgage distressed funds, jump in, and you can kind of see it looks like almost like a staircase going down. Well, we're getting down to, you know, 20. It's, it's not possible really to go below zero there, and I think people are looking at that, and they're starting to saying, you know, this stuff is, is dirt cheap. As soon as we're sure that, you know, we, this is the last rung on the ladder, the last step, I think there's a lot of money willing to jump in, and, and we're, we're kind of seeing that. Every time we have one of these downturns, things kind of pick up very quickly. There's a rebound the next day. 
So yes, that's kind of what I think. We're, we've been, a lot of people are shell-shocked, have gone through this, bought a little bit too early. They've been stung four times, but now I think uh, there's a lot of folks that will step up and start buying this stuff. It'll be very quickly liquid once it's evident that we have hit the bottom of the market. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Lemer, in the most recent UCLA Anderson forecast, you wrote the low rates of interest, the innovations in the financial markets, and the tax cuts have turned us into a consumption-loving, debt-ridden, foreign-depending society. Why such a party pooper? I thought this is what we were supposed to do. This is America. I thought we were going to be an ownership society, so that would have meant more, uh, more investment. That didn't occur. I mean, what's happened over the last four or five years is the consumption side, which, which our dean said was 70%. It used to be 67. It used to be two-thirds of the economy. That's actually elevated up to about 72%. And so where'd that 6% come from? That's the <clears throat> us out there using our credit cards to spend beyond our means. Our net national savings rates are, are zero, or actually negative, which means that we're not uh, we're eating our seed corn. We're not passing on a capital stock that uh, is as good as what we inherited. The capital stock of the U.S. is still growing, but it isn't we who own it. It's the foreigners. So we're very heavily dependent on uh, that huge capital inflow from foreigners into the United States. And this, we've been saying this can't last forever. You know, we, we, they said that in 2000, and the external deficit has to close in 2001, 2002. At some point, there's a realization that uh, we're spending beyond our means. And uh, the bad news on housing is slap in the face. The, the slap in the face that we all receive when we, when we fill up our SUVs, that's a way of reminding consumers that you've got to start cutting back spending and preparing for retirements in the old-fashioned way we're an aging society. And I, this may be the moment in time when you have that structural adjustment. That has big implications for investments because anything that's dependent on selling uh, mundane uh, consumer uh, goods or services is going to have trouble going forward. Like retail, we've got a retail infrastructure which is appropriate to the consumption-loving society. We're likely to cut that back. So the investment opportunities in retail floor space seem to be pretty minimal. And it goes on and on. You've got to recognize that sometimes you don't get the V-shaped cycle. We talk about a business cycle, that means you get the first stroke of the V, the economy changes, the second stroke of the V, it changes back. This may be one of these structural adjustments in which we get a decline in spending on the consumer side relative to incomes, and it never comes back to where it was. It's a structural adjustment that lies ahead. Really, the question is when it's gonna occur. Uh, Professor Roll, you founded and directed Goldman Sachs's Mortgage Securities Research Group since these uh, 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 MBAs seem to be the, uh, the securities that are the whipping boy uh, for many of the ills on Wall Street at the moment. Can we blame you, since <laughs> no one else is stepping up to take credit for it? Uh, why did something that had been, you know, it, it, everything about it, you know, just, you know, the liquidity that they created, the expansion of the housing market, everything seemed so pure and wonderful about the creation of these instruments, and yet this also now is being blamed on the current implosion that we're going through. What, uh, what went wrong? Well, I left Goldman Sachs and came back to UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, uh, yes, it's true that uh, that a lot of Wall Street firms and a lot of a lot of professors have, uh, like Francis, have dreamed up uh, securities and things that uh, allow people <laughs> to do a lot of hedging and uh, speculating and things. I mean, I dreamed up a few myself, you know, strip mortgage-backed securities and, you know, these things can be very toxic if you don't know what you're doing. And of course... Uh, Too much of that, a good thing. Yeah, they're good things if you know what you're doing and they're not if you don't. But, you know, this current crisis really was precipitated by uh, by people lending money to unqualified borrowers who never should have received loans in the first place on the presumption that housing prices would not fall. You know, the housing market went down for probably good reasons after they generated, you know, $500 billion worth of loans that had never been generated. So I think uh, you could probably blame professors a little bit for this, but I think most of it wasn't <laughs> our fault. Can, can I jump? Uh, we can blame the MBAs also. Can, can I blame, Not you guys, but those other ones. 
being an economics professor, I want to lay some blame on these finance guys. <laughs> and that, that I knew they, that was coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so these guys teach financial engineering. Engineering is a mechanical metaphor. And the thing about mechanical systems is that they behave about the same in the future as they did in the past. You can have some wear out, occasional breakdowns, but you can hire a statistician, a mathematician, or a physicist to study mechanical systems. But we don't have a, finance is not a mechanical system, it's a human system. It's constantly evolving and innovating. And the past, consequently, is a very imperfect guide to the future. And in particularly, when you're issuing a whole new class of mortgages to a whole new class of borrowers, the historical evidence with regard to default and delinquencies isn't particularly material. And you sure as heck have it, I ought to have the wisdom not to use those things as an input into your model. No matter how complex the model is, you put in, in, in inputs that are inappropriate to the environment in the future, you're going to be making a mistake. So I, I think you got to, as a forecaster, that applies as well, which is you got to know some things repeat and some things don't. The line is constantly changing. You make money and you gain wisdom by understanding where that line is and where it should be in the future. Thank you very much. It's kind of interesting that Professor Lemer thinks that we don't understand that. <laughs> let me. Uh, I'm let only me, the moderator. I'm not getting you, in between you guys. You understand it. You don't act like you understand it. So. <laughs> Thank you. Let me chime in also. I think uh, if we were. <laughs> let me just say a word about financial engineering. Um, if I give you a hundred dollar bill, you might feel like you're a lot richer. But what if I then tell you, you are not allowed to spend that $100 bill? You can't deposit it in the bank. You can't use it to pay any debts. And you can't spend it. You've got to hold it in your wallet for the next 30 years. Are you really $100 richer? Well, this is the essence of the problem we call illiquidity. There are a lot of financial assets or real assets out there, real estate, uh, you, you name it, a lot of securities, assets. They are illiquid, and because they're illiquid, their worth is a lot less than they would be otherwise, uh, less than the present value of the cash flows, because you can't use them for consumption. The essence of what's been going on in financial engineering and with the growth of these derivative markets, which get uh, so easily blamed, is that we've been taking illiquid assets, you know, investments in private equity, et cetera, putting them together in portfolios and then making them liquid and actually, I argue, creating a lot of value for the economy. So I think a lot of these structures actually provide liquidity, create wealth. Yes, they can be used or abused, but I think fundamentally these things, the structuring, this uh, financial, creating things that are more liquid actually has a huge uh, social value and contributes to the, uh, the wealth of the economy. So that's my little spiel about uh, financial engineering. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to open it up to audience uh, questions. Please step down to the microphone. Please keep the question concise, not a statement. And they sell any of their securities. Then they have to mark them all down to fire sale prices, whereas that maybe it's not actually an accurate valuation. So if the bills that have gone before the House and Congress don't, solve that problem, what do you think that we can do about that to kind of unfreeze that market and, and solve that problem? Well, I, I, maybe I gave you the wrong impression. I'm not 100% against uh, giving some flexibility to people to change from mark to market uh, accounting, especially in cases where you have fire sale, so-called fire sale prices and so on. Um, you know, I'm willing, I, I think maybe that in some cases, especially some of the institutions that are in trouble today, that that would help them to be able to not, not do that. And maybe they would be able to grow out of their situation if they didn't have to mark to market and become insolvent. So, uh, you know, I, I quoted you what the SEC has already said about this, and the Financial Accounting Standard Boards is considering a change in FASB 157, which is that rule. You know, I'm kind of, I'm not so sure. I, I don't like it because, you know, my, my gut instinct is that it's transparency is mark to market. You should do it. But I can see the argument in some cases where that would be a benefit to the, you know, to the whole financial system. Can, can I just say something that on this plan that the, the, uh, the essence of the point is that you need not just to create a market, but many of these firms have to have a capital infusion at the same time in order to deal with capital adequacy problems. 
and the Treasury can only do that by overpaying for the assets. Well, so the it's a backdoor, indirect way of, of uh, infusing capital, and it's in, in it's a very inappropriate way of doing that capital infusion. Uh, but, but let me, let me th those two things are related because suppose the bill passes and, <coughs> and the Treasury Secretary has money to give to those institutions by buying part of those underwater assets. The, I don't think those institutions will sell the assets to the Treasury if they have to mark to market their entire portfolio. So you can have all the money in the world to buy stuff from people that are underwater but if by selling part of their portfolio, they become bankrupt, they will not sell anything. You see, I mean, that's, so those two things are very closely related. The market-to-market -market accounting and the, and the capital infusion, you know, there, there won't be any external capital infusion to people in that, of that type if, if market-to-market -market accounting isn't altered to some extent, I, I think. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Uh, all of y'all uh, talked about, you know, issues that you had with the current bailout package that they're voting on right now. What do you uh, actually think they should do instead? And if the answer is nothing, what do you think the short-term implications of that are? Well, let me uh, maybe jump in here. Um, I, I agree with uh, my colleagues here. I think there are a number of very practical, uh, useful alternatives uh, to the current uh, bill. Uh, I think, and I think we all agree, that the ultimate problem right now is one of capital structure, just inappropriate for a lot of these financial institutions. Too much debt, not enough equity. And so what really needs to happen is a recapitalization of the financial sector. You know, some of the things that uh, I'd like to propose, for example, is that uh, we basically just uh, tell banks they can't pay dividends anymore, for example. That would instantly, well, not instantly, over the next year, add an extra $50 billion worth of capital. Banks feel like they have to pay dividends, but if the government said, well, you can't, they would actually be very happy because they could keep that capital. In fact, I'd go further and argue that, in fact, what we should have is a rebate of uh, the uh, income taxes that financial institutions have uh, paid over the last few years. Since dividends aren't deductible, they're essentially taxed twice. If we could rebate that back, we'd have then a quick uh, capital injection into the financial sector. It's really kind of just rebating their own taxes, not your taxes. And so I think uh, anything that would recapitalize the banking sector, like uh, injection of uh, capital via preferred stock, would, would go a long ways to, to kind of solving the ultimate crisis. And in conclusion, let me just go ahead and say I really think that uh, this getting rid of mark-to-market accounting is a bad idea. I mean, if I go golfing and I hit three putts and I get put down two on the scorecard, like my colleagues here do, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I'm still a lousy golfer. And I, I don't think we're better off by sort of cooking the books and uh, kind of pretending that the problem really isn't there, thinking it's temporary. I think the prices now are actually better prices than they were two years ago. I, I want to jump in on this, too, because we have a plan, a new plan that was really produced by Kip Agopian, one of our members of the Board of Visitors, a very wise plan. He was uh, nice enough to allow me to put my name on it as well. But what that plan involves is a public-private partnership. Rather than the Treasury deciding which firms to do their capital injection into, rather than the Treasury deciding what these mortgage-backed securities are worth, have, have uh, the Treasury share, meaning that they will match dollar to dollar any kind of private decision with regard to mortgage-backed securities, and then the treasurer, we, the taxpayers, and the private investors share equally on the losses, but the gains are shared disproportionately to the private sector because they're, they're bringing knowledge and wisdom about what these assets ought to be valued at. And you do the same thing with regard to capital infusion. And, and the treasury gets a bit, the same deal as the private sector, split equally the losses, but you let the um, a disproportionate share of the gains accrue to the private sector. And the logic of that is the private sector knows a heck of a lot better than any pro government official in the Treasury about two critical things, which is how valuable these mortgage-backed securities really, which depends on future default and delinquency rates and future home values. Somebody's got to do some hard work to decide that. And secondly, the private sector knows which firms ought to be uh, continue to live and which firms ought to be uh, going to bankruptcy. We need more bankruptcy. We have a financial sector which is uh, much larger than it needs to be. Thank you. Next question, please. I, I like the line, we need more bankruptcy. I guess for our moderator, I would love to see a story that says, um, room full of young uh, UCLA MBAs cheers the decline in house values as now they'll finally be able to buy a house. <laughs> I've never understood why that story doesn't appear. If this MBA gig doesn't work out, the bankruptcy attorneys are 
<laughs> going to provide a lot of work. No, but more seriously, the, in the discussion from the panel, the discussion in the press, everywhere, it seems uh, there's this fear of bankruptcy. And then I'm going to go teach undergraduate finance in a few hours, and it raises in my mind the question of am I, what am I supposed to say about the Medigliani-Miller theorem? And we talk about, at first, the irrelevance of the debt equity split for financing, and then there's tax reasons and costs of financial distress. But it seems like we're, if we buy into that this is such a big crisis, we're moving to a view that the social cost of bankruptcy far exceeds the private cost. And then I would think going forward, that's going to drive you to a view that you're going to have to have widespread regulation, basically, of balance sheets if it's really the case that we need government injections to do recapitalizations, we need government policy to fix debt equity divisions within the financial system. So I'd be curious about comments about that. I think uh, one of the, you know, to put uh, kind of a silver lining on a dark cloud, one of the things we've learned is uh, the experience a couple of weeks ago of letting Lehman go bankrupt. Up to that point, that was unimaginable because there were all these swap agreements and counterparty risk, and we were all worried it would come down like a house of cards. We'd never gone through this experiment of letting one of these major money center uh, investment banks fail. Well, it was kind of uncomfortable. I was on the trading floor, and we spent, you know, our guys spent like 48 hours, 72 hours, basically renegotiating all the swap contracts with different uh, counterparties. But at the end of the week, it got done, and the swap system, you know, the, uh, the OTC derivatives market didn't come down. It actually ended up being a bit of a non-event. Most people were able to unwind their Lehman swaps or replace them with someone else. So the big fear that we all had previous to that, that this whole thing would bring down the financial system, uh, seems to have evaporated. So I'm actually much less concerned about the social implications, uh, costs of bankruptcy uh, as a result of that. So I got to ask uh, Francis, I thought the problems in the commercial paper was a, a ripple effect of the name in bankruptcy. Well, we've been having those problems since the beginning of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, certainly the asset-backed commercial paper market uh, really took a huge hit, was down 30, 40 percent already by January. You know, people adapt, it's painful, but you so know, the biggest is, victims are the limo services on Wall Street and the private jet brokers? <laughs> the fat cat bankers? <laughs> you know, the so, you mean the so, I'm not sure there is any social cost of bankruptcy. Is that what you were trying to... That's uh, what Bernanke's research is all about. Yeah, the well... The, the, the the Great yeah, well... Yeah, it, for certainly the, there's a transfer. You know, there are a bunch of transfers in bankruptcy occurs, but whether or not that you know, represents a social cost, it's... Uh, Seems pretty so, so the, 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 the uh, Bernanke, more than anybody, should we understand that we have a totally different kind of financial system than we did in the Great Depression, and the risk of the, uh, the sequence of bank runs that really were material in affecting the Great Depression, uh, then uh, bank runs that weren't taken over, they just shut down, and people couldn't get their money out, and you had a huge rise in unemployment. That's just such an implausible story in, in the kind of economy that we're operating with. And we don't need that kind of scare tactics from our leaders. We have time for just one more question, please. Uh, I think this is probably what everyone's thinking in the mind. Uh, is there going to be a recession, and how long is this going to last? Yeah, so we think that you're going to have this sort of extended serial adjustment, where the problems in housing are going to be mostly behind us the, the mid part of this year, and you're going to have weakness on autos. The auto sector is going to be trouble for the next couple of years. The, uh, anything related to consumers, consumers are going to be sluggish, so it's going to be an extended serial adjustment to the debt-driven overspending bins that we had from, uh, well, really started in the 90s through 2007. But, but we're still hoping, we're clinging to hope. By the way, uh, you're talking about incentive systems. The forecast, me in particular, has no incentive for it to change my mind about the no forecast, no recession. Because all that does is embarrasses me that I was not, I didn't understand how the economy is going to evolve. But we have a heck of an incentive to hold on to the no recession and hope that it doesn't really occur. I'm hopeful that, again, if you go out and buy shoes and purses, you're going to help my career greatly. <laughs> uh, Forrest, would you like to um, close this out, please? Thank you very much. I just want to get up here and thank uh, our esteemed panelists and moderator for their time. So, round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.
the current economic environment that we're in is evolving over time. This is a, a moving target. Uh, these gentlemen were gracious enough to make themselves available on very short notice. Also, I'd like to thank Dean Olean, Dean McArdle, Stella Marks, uh, Michael Heafy, everybody that participated in making this, this town hall meeting possible and come together really in, in the term of 48 hours. So it was to be responsive to all of you, to the concerns going on, and to respond to the Anderson community. So thank you to everybody involved. <laughs>